This is Speaking of Shakespeare. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube, you should know that this program is also available on your favorite podcast platform. When we began this series in 2020, we necessarily had to feature our guests online only because of the COVID pandemic. In 2023, it was our great pleasure to be able to host two fine speakers for in-person talks for students, faculty, and the general public on our campus here in Tokyo. This talk is the second of the two and by Stephen Wittick of Carnegie Mellon University. Stephen kindly allowed us to record this talk and share it online. Stephen is known for several contributions that he has made to early modern studies, including his work on virtual reality in Shakespeare and the study of early modern media. Here, he will talk about his recent book on conversion, religious and otherwise, in the early modern period. This series has been maintained with support from the Aoyama Gakuin Institute of the Humanities, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. And thank you so much for coming, Stephen. It's just wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, reception. Uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, Thomas uh, for arranging this talk. It is uh, a real honor and a pleasure uh, to be in Tokyo today. Uh, if I wish I could go back and tell my 12-year-old self, you know, in a few years you're going you're to be in Tokyo giving a lecture uh, at a university there. It would have blown my mind, and my mind is blown. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Um, so as Thomas mentioned, uh, I am Professor Stephen Wittick, and I am from uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And I'm here to talk to you uh, about some work from my new book, here it is here, called Shakespeare and the Cultural Politics of Conversion. It is hot off the press. It just came out uh, with Palgrave Macmillan just a few uh, months ago. Um, so uh, when most people uh, think about conversion, Thomas has already mentioned conversion today, and I know uh, it's uh, something I imagine that has come up in, I understand this is the Bible class, right? That's so right. Um, certainly there's no shortage of conversion uh, in the Bible, St. Paul, of course. Uh, I think when most people think about conversion today, uh, we tend to think of it uh, as this very sort of uh, churchy kind of concern, uh, 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 as a concept that's grounded uh, primarily in religious doctrine. Uh, and I want to say, uh, or in uh, theology, uh, and I wanted to begin, and Thomas again has already given us a hint of this, uh, by just noting that uh, I, that's almost precisely not uh, the perspective that I'm coming from today. Uh, uh, one of the key interventions that my colleagues and I uh, have endeavored to make uh, in conversion studies uh, is to study various forms of conversional phenomena from not so much a theological perspective, but from a cultural studies perspective. Uh, that is to say, we want to show how ideas about conversion are caught up with various forms of identity construction. Right? Cultural studies is very, very much about uh, identity and the social work uh, that uh, artworks do in the world. Um, and of course, again, not only religious identity, but also identities centered on politics, uh, identities centered on race and nationality uh, and class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's all sorts of different types of conversion. Um, uh, with this goal in view, we define conversion uh, not according to the terms of any particular doctrine. We tend to define conversion, as it says here, uh, as a set of ideas and practices pertaining to the means by which an individual might move from one category of identity to another category of identity, right? So how do you start off? If you're born, for example, uh, as a Protestant or raised in a... Uh, 
uh, Protestant family. Well, that was you. <laughs> How, what happens? What are the means by which uh, you move over into another category of identity and become, say, a Muslim or a Catholic or something like that? Um, so there's not just only one model of conversion. There's actually many, many, many. It's this sort of very in-between the categories uh, type of thing in a very, very kind of complex uh, and a very powerful uh, cultural idea that works uh, in many, many different ways across a great variety of cultures. Uh, conversion is an especially important focus of analysis for scholars such as myself and such as Thomas, who study the culture of early modernity. When I use that term early modernity, I mean uh, roughly speaking, depending on who you're talking to, uh, we're talking, it's the years from around 1500 uh, to 1800, a period uh, also sometimes referred to as the Renaissance. That's kind of the older term. Um, so this is the time of uh, great thinkers and artists, such as William Shakespeare, of course, but also uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, this is uh, a period of dramatic cultural change. It is a period of tremendous advancements in conversional activity. Uh, it is a period of tremendous advancements in conversional thinking as well. So uh, to cite just a few big examples one might think about how conversion factored into big, uh, you know, global uh, events uh, such as uh, the Reformation, uh, or how conversion factored into colonial developments in the New World, uh, how it factored into the evolution of racialized thinking. And we're here in the uh, area where uh, the modern concept of race is just starting to come in to become uh, what it knows today. It's also the period uh, of the rise of globalism and increasing interactivity between nations. Uh, and conversion has a role to play uh, in all of these advancements, right? Lots of category switching and category blending. And all of this activity, of course, had a massive impact on the evolving structures of self-identification. Uh, the structures and the means by which people come to uh, think about their own personhood, how they define themselves uh, to themselves and to others. Um, uh, uh, so a massive impact on the evolving structures of self-identification, notably uh, not only for the converts of early modern Europe and its worlds, uh, but also a massive impact uh, for people in our own age as well. So there's a real legacy of the early modern uh, uh, developments in conversional thinking uh, that's very, very present, uh, urgently present, I would even say, in our own age. Uh, so to give you a sense of what I'm talking about here, uh, just in the past few decades, you can see the legacy of conversional thought uh, in the cultural conversions violently imposed on Aboriginal children in Canada, uh, where I'm from, uh, or uh, the so-called conversion therapies purporting to correct uh, sexual preference uh, uh, in the United States and a number of other places as well. Um, so with all of this context in mind then, my book focuses on the relation of conversion to Shakespeare and the theater. Uh, it's important to note, I was just making this same note uh, when I was doing a previous lecture on virtual reality, but it's, it's central to how I think of the theater. Uh, it's important to note that commercial theater, by commercial theater I mean uh, theater where you're paying a penny to get in. It's not done, it's not free, right? Like uh, uh, earlier forms of theater in England. Now it's an industry, it's a business. They're running uh, five to six times a week. Uh, they've got this theater and they wanna fill it up with as many people because the more people who come, the more money you make, right? Um, commercial theater was a brand new industry in the Elizabethan period. Uh, and it functioned not only as a form of entertainment, and it certainly was entertaining, uh, but it also, in addition to being entertaining, it's also a central forum uh, for public discourse. 
Uh, that is to say, the theater was a place where people could go to talk and to think things together, uh, think through the most important issues of the day. Um, especially important to remember, uh, um, uh, just to get a sense of how important theater is to the culture in this period. Uh, in early modern London, uh, the literacy rate is, depending on who you're talking to, maybe somewhere around 20% of people can read, right? Uh, so those print printed playtext editions of Shakespeare's plays, those are really only available uh, to a very, very elite sliver of the population. Not only Shakespeare's plays, but anything written. Uh, the theater, on the other hand, can speak to anybody. Costs one penny to get into some, a place like the Globe Theater. A very, very uh, affordable price. It's about uh, the same amount of money that you would pay for a big loaf of bread or a gallon of beer. Right? You could, if you're an average working day person, you can afford to go to the theater once a week. That would be within your budget. Um, um, so the theater then is a place where you can go uh, to see other people and be together with other people uh, in a public forum. Um, and of course, uh, one of the things people are thinking about together in the theater, uh, uh, in addition to many, many other things, are issues pertaining to identity, right? Uh, you know, uh, what does it mean to be a Catholic or a Protestant or a Jew? What do Turks look like? Right? Um, uh, identity is very, very important. Uh, as if uh, by magic, when you go to the theater, you're standing there, or maybe if you're uh, a little bit better off, you can afford one of the seats. A professional actor can step onto the stage uh, and this almost magical ability to transform himself uh, into a Jew. And then you go back to the theater the next day, the same guy is a Jesuit. Uh, and then maybe he changes roles in between scenes. He comes back, he's a Puritan, or he's a Turk. Uh, and it goes on and on and on, right in front of you. So uh, theater has this really tremendous capacity uh, for transformation. It is a place where uh, these remarkable transformations take place uh, right in front of you bef uh, before your very eyes. And this capacity for transformation naturally drew attention to the ever-present threat of dissimulation. People pretending to be things that they're not. This is uh, entertaining, but it's also kind of dangerous, right? Uh, it draws attention to the difficulty of judging outward claims about interior states. This is one of the great anxieties for people in the early modern period. How do I know? Appearances and reality, right? How do I know? This person, uh, well, he looks like a Protestant like me, right? He talks the right way and addresses the right way, but how can I ever really know? what's actually going on in that person's mind. This is, uh, in philosophy, they discuss, uh, call this the problem of other minds, right? Uh, so you can see uh, how conversional politics play into this anxiety, right? How can I ever know somebody, you know, he says that he's uh, on my team, but he might be part of the other team, right? He says he's an X, he's a Y. How can I know myself? So theater's capacity for transformation naturally draws attention uh, to these threats of dissimulation, something people are very uh, concerned about in the period. So by applying these special capabilities in a forum that could speak to people across the social spectrum at varying levels of literacy, drama became a key vehicle for modeling and refining and analyzing conversional significations. This is another important point, too. I think uh, very, very often when people talk about the theater and think about the theater, they talk about it in terms of just sort of mirroring what's going on in society, right? Uh, I would go much further than that. I would say uh, the theater isn't just merely uh, uh, holding a mirror up to society, as Hamlet says, but it's actually uh, the door is swinging both ways, so to speak. It's helping uh, to create the culture as well. Um, so overall, uh, the book, uh, this is the table of contents here, uh, the book presents a picture of Shakespeare as an aggressively inquisitive contributor to conversional thought. Shakespeare is thinking a lot about conversion in one way or another. 
uh, uh, so, uh, and is just, uh, as is his nature for everything, he's just asking lots and lots and lots of questions um, and wants to always, is, is never really satisfied uh, to settle on just one answer, right? Shakespeare, uh, for those of you who know and uh, have read Shakespearean drama, he always offers you a multiplicity of options. Uh, so an aggressively inquisitive contributor to conversional thought. He also, I think it comes out uh, through the book, uh, that Shakespeare's fairly skeptical around ideas of conversion, particularly uh, any sort of conversional gesture that's redolent of hypocrisy or credulity or anything overly suspicious uh, or sort of uh, more like more old fashioned sort of uh, supernatural uh, beliefs uh, puts a lot of pressure on those sorts of ideas. Uh, particularly hypocrisy, as we'll see uh, when we get to uh, The Tempest shortly. Uh, well, we're there now. Uh, so the material that I want to share with you today derives uh, from the seventh chapter of the book, uh, where I'm talking about The Tempest. Uh, and in my reading, uh, I, what I do is I read The Tempest alongside uh, uh, a pool of documents from the Virginia Company's propaganda campaign uh, from 1609 to 1610. Uh, so the Virginia Company, for those of you who might not have heard of it before, this was the company uh, that was responsible for initiating colo uh, England's colonial ventures, right? So uh, going out, it, uh, often I think the way, it, the, the, the assumption anyway is the, sort of, the, it's the state and the king, uh, but that technically that's not correct. What happens uh, is uh, there is a company uh, and it's a business and they're going, you know, they have to get the king's permission, uh, but they're going out uh, and on these colonial ventures uh, as a way usually to seek profit. Um, so there's this big propaganda push uh, right around, just in the years, right, right before Shakespeare writes The Tempest, around 1609 to 1610. So with the goal of elucidating Shakespeare's response uh, to colonialism, uh, which is one of the most pressing uh, ethical uh, issues of his time, there's lots of debate around this whole idea of going over uh, into the new world and establishing uh, colonies and extracting resources and how you're gonna deal with indigenous people, right? Uh, uh, lots and lots of debate around that. Uh, so within uh, the goal of elucidating that debate, uh, my uh, uh, reading of The Tempest uh, argues that the specific target of Shakespeare's critique in The Tempest is not necessarily the general concept of colonialism in and of itself. We're not really at a point uh, 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 here uh, where we can, it makes a whole lot of sense to think of Shakespeare as something like an anti-colonialist. Um, uh, it's not quite there. Uh, it'd be more uh, precise, I think, to say that really where uh, the attention of his analysis is focused is on the specious posturing of the colonial rhetoric or sorry, that that colonial rhetoric typically entailed, uh, especially as that posturing related to claims about conversion. Um, so it seems uh, uh, to, to me, um, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to know exactly, you know, is, is Shakespeare in favor of colonialism or is he not? Uh, uh, very, very difficult to say, I think, with any high degree of certainty. Uh, this is a dramatist uh, who likes to leave questions like that uh, wide open and wants his audience to engage and, and think about, uh, find answers for themselves. Uh, where he does apply a lot of pressure, as we'll see though, is on sort of the posturing uh, and the hyperbole uh, that is and the hypocrisy that is uh, surrounding uh, uh, propaganda of his time. Okay, so here's The Tempest. Uh, this is the title page of The Tempest from uh, Shakespeare's uh, 1623 folio, 400 years old this, to, uh, this year. Uh, so Shakespeare centers his analysis in The Tempest around questions concerning the prospect of converting other people through the application of persuasion and the application of uh, coercive force. Uh, he asks questions about claims at the heart of colonial ideology. Uh, and particularly 
uh, the claim that he uh, puts the most pressure on, I think, uh, is the claim that conversion can both justify and also facilitate the subjugation of indigenous people. Uh, at the heart of this analysis, one finds two versions of Duke Prospero. Prospero, of course, is the central sort of magus figure in the play. Uh, at the heart of his analysis, we get two versions of Duke Prospero juxtaposed against each other. Uh, the first is the version of Prospero uh, that Prospero wants us to see. Uh, that is uh, uh, an image of a sage and just ruler who is doing the right thing, who is sort of acting as a father, uh, protecting his children, right? Prospero wants to give us a version of events that make Prospero look like the good guy. The other Prospero uh, is a much less flattering picture of a violent and manipulative usurper. Uh, and this image of Prospero comes out mostly uh, through uh, other characters, uh, particularly the character Caliban. So we've got these two Prosperos, two, two sort of different ideas of him, um, and they're sort of contrasted against each other. Uh, and Shakespeare, as I already said, sort of leaves us to make up our own mind about exactly what's going on. Okay. Um, before I get into The Tempest, though, uh, I want to go through some details of what's going on in early modernity uh, just in the year or two right before Shakespeare writes The Tempest, right? What are people talking about? What's, what's exciting? How are they thinking? How does uh, The Tempest uh, connect to topical discourse at the time? Well, uh, as I've already said, Really, one of the biggest issues right around 1609 and 1610 is this whole idea is like, by God, for, you know, it's uh, fairly recently um, uh, that, you know, ideas of, and reports of the new world in general have been coming through Europe, right? Um, and now England has this prospect of, you know, there's uh, 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 many other countries uh, have sent uh, and uh, expeditions to the New World. Um, and Spain, especially, has been getting all this money, all this silver uh, from Spain. Uh, and England is beginning to imagine themselves as getting in on the game, right? Maybe we can, we can become a really super wealthy country too. England at this point in history, by the way, uh, it was not a world superpower the way, you know, well, this is before the great age of empire. It's still this fairly obscure island country uh, up in the corner of Europe there. Uh, but they're beginning to get a greater sense of nationhood uh, and it's quite an intoxicating fantasy. England can join, you know, the great powers uh, on, the, on the world stage. Um, uh, okay, uh, so uh, I want to set the table for my analysis by giving you an overview then of the pro-colonial propaganda campaign that played out from 1609 to 1610, right at this time. This is what people are talking about. Shortly before the play's initial appearance, uh, on the English stage. So uh, we don't have a 100% uh, secure date for the first performances of the uh, Tempest, but probably around somewhere around 1611. By 1609, when the campaign began, the Virginia Company's failures in America were painfully apparent. Uh, so they had been uh, trying to get things started, get this new colony in Virginia, um, but it, things were not going well at all. Uh, it was very, very bad news for the company. They're losing money like crazy. Uh, nobody wants to invest uh, any more money in these expeditions because it's really looking uh, like a real boondoggle. Uh, in less than a year, almost two-thirds of the 105 colonists who set out for Jamestown in late 1606 had succumbed either to, the, a lot of them just starved to death uh, many others died just of a result of diseases. Uh, so this is an outcome then that resulted in part uh, from the unanticipated refusal of the Algonquin leader, Powhatan, to accede to the colonists' plans for domination. Uh, people in England, because they had heard all these very, very rosy reports coming in from other countries, they had this built-in presumption 
uh, that they would go over to the New World. They build this colony, and they really expected that the indigenous people uh, would welcome them with open arms and feed them and shelter them, basically become their slaves and just sort of do everything for them. I, uh, it's astonishing when you look at the light records how poorly prepared they were uh, just because they were planning around this presumption that oh, we'll get over there and all these people are just naturally going to serve us. Um, that definitely was not the case. I think they did get a fairly warm welcome uh, initially, but the indigenous people then was kind of like this moment where, they, what, and you want us to like work for you and feed you? Like, that's not going to, it's not going to happen, right? No, uh, you guys can starve or go back to England. Uh, so, uh, this, so then the whole exposition uh, is a real disaster uh, for the Virginia Company. The people are losing money. So they're desperate uh, to improve, improve uh, uh, public approval, right? They need spin doctors. Like today, when a politician's in trouble, right? He hires consultants. Like, uh, let's get, uh, you know, uh, some positive news stories out, get people talking and improve my public image. That's the sort of thing that the company was engaged in. So they're desperate to improve public approval and to shore up investment. Uh, so the Virginia Company commissioned a massive promotional push uh, that entailed a series of speeches. There's uh, public speeches, uh, public sermons, um, also, uh, and then many of those speeches and sermons were circulating in printed editions uh, all over, you know, so you could go, uh, you know, all of the print stalls of early modern London. You could hear the speech or the sermon uh, and then uh, read it on your own as well. So just pushing lots of material out into the public sphere uh, to try and put a good slant on the Virginia uh, expeditions. Um, uh, these materials repeatedly de-emphasized profit incentives. Uh, that's the key thing here. Uh, in order to frame the Virginia project not as an opportunity to make investors wealthy, but as a patriotic divinely ordained mission to civilize and convert the savage, quote unquote, savage Algonquins, uh, whose resistance to English authority only provided further proof of their irrationality and further justification for coercive measures. Um, so this is the key turn here. Um, before 1610, when the Virginia Company is trying to get people to invest, uh, they do it the way uh, a company even today would try and get people to invest, right? Apple says, buy our stock, we're going to do really, really well, there's going to be great return on your investment, you're going to get really, really wealthy, right? That's the way uh, st uh, stock promotions uh, generally work. Uh, the thing about uh, this propaganda campaign of 1609 and 1610 is there's a complete turn away from that uh, line of persuasion. Uh, because they know <laughs> that investing at this point in history, investing uh, in uh, a Virginia colony, I mean, it would turn out to be extraordinarily profitable, uh, but at this point in history, they kind of know uh, the chances aren't very good, right? People starve, uh, there's disease. Uh, so they completely switch tactics, and the argument becomes not invest in our company, we're going to make you rich, but no, there's no money in this, we're not doing this for money, right? This is, look at these Algonquins. They, you know, they're resistant, they're savage, they're these terrible people. We've got a religious duty as good English Christians uh, to go over there and convert them and bring them in uh, to our religion. Uh, that is the new argument. Um, notably, these developments coincided with the establishment of a new plantation in the Irish province of Ulster. Uh, an effort that also struggled with financial difficulties and conflicts with the indigenous population. Uh, and Ireland, uh, in the book I go into this in a much more de uh, detail, uh, but Ireland is really, really important here um, because um, uh, uh, England has, you know, had been trying, had also with a, a great deal of difficulty and a great deal of struggle, um, had had colonial ventures uh, in Ireland, uh, going back to the uh, time of uh, Henry VIII, uh, and actually even further back uh, than that. Um, 
Uh, and the same sort of story as what they were facing in Virginia, struggles with the indigenous population and uh, trying to establish colonies using conversion uh, as a tool of sort of controlling indigenous populations. So uh, Ireland in a lot of ways provided the uh, blueprint uh, not only tactically, but also conceptually for what England was trying to do in Virginia. They were kind of thinking of Virginia sort of as another Ireland in a way. <clears throat> so long story short then, by 1610, people in England were hearing a lot of very troubling news about the country's two major colonies in Ireland uh, and in Virginia. Uh, and a lot of aggressive propaganda that sought to spin colonization as a matter of national destiny and religious duty. <clears throat> okay, here we have, this is uh, King James I here. Look at that, hey, that's uh, pretty good. Uh, I like the little bows on his shoes there. <laughs> Get a set of those. Okay. So to get a sense of the rhetorical shift from the, you know, the shift I'm talking about here is the, uh, from the profit incentives to uh, conversional incentives, to get a sense of how that works in colonial discourse over these years, one might start by considering James I's Royal Charter of Virginia of April the 10th, 1606. So uh, as I said, uh, the Virginia Company is, a pri is, is uh, an investment company um, but they have to get a charter from the king in order to embark on these expeditions. So, uh, and this is a document that we still have, the, the charter, kind of like a license to allow them to go ahead and do this. Um, so the charter begins by expressing a very, very kind of uh, non-committal hope that the colony may in time bring the Christian religion and a settled and quiet government to what uh, the charter refers to as infidels and savages and such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. Okay, so that's the language. This is of uh, uh, 1606. So this is uh, the, what the rhetoric looks like before the propaganda campaign, right? I'll give you a little bit uh, after. Okay, so uh, by reading these perfunctory comments with an eye toward the propaganda campaign that would follow three years later, uh, one can see that many of the fundamental pieces of the evangelical argument or the conversional argument uh, are already present, right? He's thinking about this, okay, what's, what's the good we can do? Uh, but there's also a notable absence of immediacy or concerted intention. James merely notes that the conversion of the Algonquins might become a felicitous byproduct of the company's initiatives at some point in the distant future. Right? So it's uh, a little bit fuzzy and, you know, he's not thinking of uh, conversion and uh, evangelism as the main thing that they're trying to do. Uh, then, uh, and he sort of has this little bit at the beginning, uh, and then he switches immediately to a more detailed discussion of more pressing matters. Most of the document in that charter is about, uh, okay, if you find any silver, I want a ch uh, cut of it in, in the form of taxes, right? Uh, so conversion is not central. Uh, in contrast, by the time of the second royal charter of 1609, uh, this is uh, uh, right around the same time that this uh, big propaganda push begins. <clears throat> Evangelization had become the central goal, adopting a much more aggressive posture than he had taken three years earlier. James's 1909 charter explicitly states that the principal effect or the most important thing right? now that we can desire or expect of the mission is the conversion and reduction of the people in those parts uh, unto the true worship of God uh, and the Christian religion, right? So in a nutshell, in 1606, it's mostly about silver and taxes, right? By 1609, the argument is, no, we're going uh, to build these colonies. Uh, we've got to convert the Algonquins. Look how savage they're. Uh, in order to sell their argument, uh, the propagandists had to negotiate a shaky balance between coercion or using, you know, uh, violently forcing people to do things and persuasion. Uh, and uh, this tension between coercion and persuasion, by the way, is sort of a key focus of conversion studies uh, writ large. Very, very often uh, dynamics around conversion 
uh, settle around, uh, you know, the various ways people are thinking about conversion, settle around tensions between persuasion and coercion. Okay, and uh, uh, these uh, propaganda documents are no exception. So, for example, Robert Johnson argued uh, that God hath reserved in this last stage of the world an infinite number of those lost and scattered sheep to be won and recovered by our means. Um, okay, starts off nice. Uh, that's, I guess, sort of the persuasion part. Uh, but he quickly adds that any of the quote-unquote sheep who might, quote, obstinately refuse to reunite, uh, unite themselves unto us or otherwise disturb our plantation would be held and reputed recusant, withstanding their own good, and shall be dealt with as enemies of the commonwealth of their country. So, you know, it starts off by, okay, we're going to welcome them. We're going to be very nice there. We're going to be the shepherds. They'll be the sheep. But boy, if that sheep gets out of line, the shepherd's going to strangle it, right? To avoid charges of brutality, however, they've got to be very careful about how they balance these things out. Johnson is also at pains to contrast the tactics of English colonists against the uh, more brutal, or supposedly more brutal tactics of colonists from Spain. So there had been a lot of news and a lot of criticism uh, coming in uh, from Spain and some of the very, very harsh uh, tactics that had been used uh, by uh, the Spaniards uh, uh, and other forces in their colonies. And um, the English are really at pains to say, oh, we're, you know, we're the good guys. We're the English. We're, we're Protestant and we're English. Uh, and they're defining themselves against uh, those earlier colonists, those uh, Catholic Spaniards, right? Those are the bad guys. They do, uh, they're very, very brutal. But we're not going to be like that. We're going to be the good guys. Um, so Johnson writes, our dominions shall be enlarged not by storms of raging cruelties, as West India was converted, with rapier's point and musket shot, murdering so many millions of naked Indians, but by fair and loving means, suiting to our English natures, right? We're to be fair and loving, right? Um, so this might uh, sound nice. I think fair and loving sounds very, very gentle, uh, but it's important to note here that the methods Johnson uh, is actually advocating in this document include dispossession, or stealing people's land, uh, subjugation, or enslavement. Uh, and also, one, one of the things he's very keen on uh, is kidnapping indigenous children. Right? So, uh, so that's what he means by fair and loving. We'll, we'll go and kidnap their children, bring them back to England so that they can speak English, and like, you know, go set them up as sort of uh, puppet masters back in their own colonies. Um, so uh, you know, he wants to make this uh, distinction uh, between the English and the murderous Spaniards. Uh, by saying that the English, uh, you know, we're not just going to go in and completely exterminate everybody. Uh, but, uh, you know, the tactics that he's advocating uh, weren't quite as gentle uh, as his rhetoric suggests. Okay, let's get into the Tempest then. So, uh, <clears throat> this is from an old uh, RSC uh, stage production of The Tempest, that is uh, Duke, Prospero, uh, and Ariel. Isn't that great? I'm a real sucker for these old black and white production photos. Okay. In The Tempest, uh, Shakespeare develops an analog for the propagandists with the figure of Duke Prospero. Uh, Prospero, uh, for those of you who may not be so familiar with the play, uh, is an ousted Duke from Milan. Uh, and he's been shipwrecked on this uh, island, and he's assumed control uh, over the island uh, and assumed control over the inhabitants, right? So a good analog for kind of what's happening uh, with the establishment of uh, uh, colonies in the New World and other places. In Act 1, Scene 2, we get a candid view of Prospero's attempts to establish a history where he appears as a fundamentally kind and loving, uh, benevolent ruler. So again, Prospero wants to establish a version of events that makes himself look uh, kind and loving, uh, just as the propagandists sort of wanted to make English colonial ventures look kind and loving, right? Make, we're the good guys, I'm the good guy. Prospero's versions of event get a lot of pushback 
from other characters, uh, um, especially from uh, Caliban, uh, but also from Ariel, and even a little bit about uh, uh, from Miranda and some of her interactions with Pros Prospero. There's signals, they're subtle, um, but there's all, as the play goes on and as Prospero is narrating his version of how he came to establish rule on the island, uh, there's these red flags all over the place. So th there's definitely kind of something suspicious about Prospero's story, uh, but it's uh, not especially easy uh, to tell if he's being deliberately untruthful or if he honestly believes in the righteousness of his actions. The jury's just sort of out. You have to uh, attend very carefully uh, to the blanks and kind of fill in the story yourself. Uh, and Shakespeare invites us then, you kind of have to squint at Prospero a little bit. Uh, it's elliptical. Uh, Shakespeare invites us to look at what he's saying very, very closely kind of fill in the backstory. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the character, as I said, um, uh, who uh, scrutinizes Prospero's story most aggressively is the native islander Caliban. Uh, who, uh, so Caliban, uh, uh, the story we get about Caliban is he's the offspring uh, of a witch who used to live on the island, Sycorax, but she's out of the picture now. She's been dead for some time. Uh, so when Prospero got onto the island, uh, there were these spirits, Ariel, uh, but uh, Caliban was the, uh, the in sole inhabitant and was kind of uh, in, uh, king of one, as he says uh, himself. Uh, and Prospero arrived on the island when he was shipwrecked with Miranda, and all of that changed. Uh, and uh, Caliban uh, enslaved, or sorry, Prospero enslaved Caliban, makes him work for him, and uh, um, has established his rule over the island. Okay, so, uh, and Caliban doesn't have very many nice things to say about Prospero. A few, but not many. Uh, so here's Caliban then, right uh, at the beginning of the play. He just comes on and immediately takes over the play. So here is uh, Caliban. This island's mine by Sycorax my mother, which thou takest from me. When thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me, wouldst give me water with berries in it, and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less that burn by day and night. And then I loved thee and showed thee all the qualities of the isle, the fresh springs, brine pits, barren place and fertile. Cursed be I that did so. All the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, bats, light on you, for I am all the subjects you have, which first was mine own king. And here you stymie in this hard rock whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island. So uh, in short, Caliban is accusing Prospero of manipulation, uh, and exploitation and dispossession, right? You're gonna, you tricked me and you're exploiting me and you've stolen from me. These are all uh, the same accusations that the Virginia Company propagandists are seeking to refute, right? It's okay, no, we're not, because uh, there's a lot of pushback uh, against the propagandists as well, right? No, we're not stealing, This is, we're on a just mission from God. We're, we're not exploiting and enslaving. We uh, have to convert these people. They, they uh, you know, this is uh, necessary for them. We're teaching them. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Notably, uh, Prospero's response to Caliban is not especially convincing. Uh, this is another one of those like, sort of little red flags around Prospero that we notice that are planted around the play. Rather than giving Caliban's inheritance claim due consideration, Prospero simply ignores the issue altogether and he refuses to recognize that Caliban uh, is, uh, 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 what he seems to be saying anyway, is Caliban just isn't uh, human enough 
to hold legal title to anything. Uh, Prospero just kind of blankly refuses to recognize Caliban's uh, personhood and humanity. This is a little bit like, you know, your cat all of a sudden standing up and saying, hey, you're enslaving me and exploiting me. Like, what are you talking, you're a cat. How, can, how could you be owner or king of anything? Seems to be Prospero's basic attitude toward Caliban. <clears throat> So uh, he just sort of sweeps the whole argument about usurpation under the carpet. Uh, and then he endeavors to reclaim the moral high ground by explaining his actions uh, as a legitimate response to treachery. So here is uh, Prospero then sort of uh, uh, refuting what Caliban uh, had, had accused him of. Prospero says, bow most lying slave whom stripes may move, not kindness. I have used thee, filth as thou art, with humane care, and lodged thee in mine own cell till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. So uh, with this retort then, uh, Prospero leverages uh, this, uh, the attempted rape of Miranda. What he's saying here is, well, you know, I, I was nice to you at first, but then you tried to rape my daughter, Miranda, and so then, of course, we had to chain you up and keep you confined. Um, but so he leverages the attempted rape of Miranda to justify his treatment of Caliban uh, and to frame himself as an innocent victim of betrayal, right? He makes, so I'm the victim here. You tried to rape my daughter. Uh, so in essence, He's arguing that he has a superior claim to governance of the island because he's morally superior and because Caliban is utterly incapable of genuine perform. And uh, although his position uh, may seem uh, reasonably just, uh, uh, given the seriousness of Caliban's attempted result, I, mean, I don't know if one can blame uh, you know, a, a father for reacting violently to an attempted rape of his daughter, it's also clear, though, that if Prospero didn't have some sort of pretext for enslavement, he would probably have to invent one because his survival on the island depends on the life-sustaining tasks that Caliban performs, such as gathering wood and making fires. All the stuff that the Virginia colonists presume that the indigenous people would do for them, Caliban does uh, for Prospero. So Prospero really needs Caliban uh, so, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, we, don't, we, we only get here Prospero's version of events and uh, Caliban's response, which we'll see. Um, but if there hadn't been some sort of uh, uh, issue and a uh, justification uh, for enslaving Caliban, Prospero would have had to invent one, uh, or else he just simply uh, wouldn't have somebody to perform all that labor. So in contrast to what Prospero's version of events would suggest then, it seems fairly clear that his attention proceeded not from genuine affection or charity. The reason he initially had that nice uh, honeymoon phase with uh, Caliban, uh, where you know, they was, had him living in his uh, uh, home with him and everything, it's not so much because uh, Prospero ever loved Caliban, but from a desire to exploit him and to convert him into a pliable subject of political control. He needs somebody to do those tasks. With these ulterior motives in view, one can see that Prospero's methods are of a piece with the policy projections of Virginia propagandists such as Johnson. He was the guy who said, oh, we're going to go in there with these fair and loving tactics. Leading with the carrot rather than a stick, so to speak, Prospero began with a fair and loving approach calculated to foster a volitional conversion. But when this effort failed, he used Caliban's rebellion as justification for the application of coercive force, thereby achieving his primary goal. Uh, the primary goal, of course, is sub subjugation, complete subjugation and enslavement. Uh, but also, while at the same time protecting a public-facing image of righteousness and just rule. So in a way, he gets to have his cake and eat it too, right? He uh, gets to uh, be the slave owner, but also gets to tell the story in such a way that makes him look like a good guy, right? Uh, that uh, he had a reason. 
When Caliban responds to Prospero's accusations by cheekily fantasizing about the children his assault might have produced, Caliban just kind of laughs at, at, at Prospero's suggestion. He goes, ah, oh, I wish I had been successful. I would have peopled the uh, island with little Calibans, right? Um, and this really raises the ire of Miranda. Miranda comes back at him. She steps into the conversation to deliver a doubly harsh rebuke that bolsters the case for dispossession uh, and enslavement. And she actually kind of goes a little bit further than her father even went. Uh, following Prospero's lead, she characterizes conversional programming as a form of charity, then posits Caliban's resistance as evidence of ingratitude and inherent civility. So you see here, there's the shape of the argument. It's very, very similar to the Virginia uh, propaganda campaign that um, uh, this uh, conversion here is an act of charity. Uh, and we have to convert you because uh, you know you're uh, you're savage. You're a savage beast, uh, and we've got to bring you into the fold and make you into a uh, you know a more respectable sort of civilized person. That we've got this kind of obligation, so to speak, uh, to enslave you. Uh, that we're doing something good for you uh, by uh, becoming your master. Okay, so here's uh, uh, Miranda to Caliban. <clears throat> Abhorred slave, which any print of goodness will not take being capable of all ill, I pitied thee, took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each hour one thing or other, when thou didst not, savage, know thine own meaning, but wouldst gabble like a thing most brutish, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. But thy vile race, though thou didst learn, had in it which good natures could not abide to be with. Therefore wast thou deservedly confined into this rock, who hadst deserved more than a prison. Um, so uh, uh, Caliban, uh, being Caliban, is not moved. But it's a very, you know, she's very, very hard at him. Uh, Caliban doesn't even blink at all, right? He's like, doesn't touch him. Uh, Caliban just responds, uh, you know, so Miranda's saying, you know, uh, I, I did all this stuff where I taught you when we arrived on this island, uh, you know, you were a complete beast, you didn't know how to speak, I taught you language, uh, you know, you owe everything to me, this was an act of mercy, an act of charity, but there's just something, you know, just so bad, inherently wrong about you. Uh, she uses that word notice. It's a very uh, uh, interesting how she's using the word race here, um, uh, which uh, in this period tends to refer um, not to you know, uh, race the way we think of it today, but more sort of as part of a tribe or part of a family group. Um, you know, that, but anyway, she's talking about what's in your blood is just wrong, right? It's, it was impossible. You're, you're, you're fundamentally, even though you were able to acquire language, there's just something fundamentally bad about you that uh, could never be fully won over, right? That uh, goodness just uh, will not take in you. Um, Caliban, as I said, is completely unmoved. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, by uh, her arguments, and he responds to Miranda with pure contempt. Here's what he has to say. He says, you taught me language, and my profit on it is that I know how to curse. The red plague rid you for learning me your language. So, uh, tellingly, Miranda says that her aim with you know, all this stuff that she was doing, trying to teach Caliban, uh, was to teach him how to speak. She uses the word speak. A uh, very interesting choice of words here uh, because it implies that Caliban had a complete lack of linguistic knowledge prior to Prospero and Miranda's arrival on the island. Uh, that uh, uh, not only, she doesn't say just like I taught you how to speak English, 
or whatever language they're uh, fictionally speaking. They're from Milan, right? So Italian. Uh, 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 but that you just didn't know how to speak any language, complete lack of linguistic ability. On her account then, the verbalizations of these noises that Caliban would made uh, upon their first uh, encounter on the island were mere gabble, another very interesting word. It's kind of fallen out of usage today. Um, uh, but gabble means incoherent nonsense, like the kind of noise that a baby makes, right? It's not language, it's just verbalizations. Um, uh, she says also, and she doubles down on that, she says that Caliban uh, did not know his own meaning, right? So there's no uh, uh, linguistic element in the noises that Caliban's making. That's, that's uh, Miranda's claim here. However, even if one takes Miranda at her word when she says that her program of language instruction proceeded from a sense of pity, it is nevertheless clear that she's unwilling to acknowledge the possibility that Caliban, uh, which seems to be actually a very, very likely possibility, by the way, that Caliban could have been speaking in his own native tongue. Um, notably, Caliban knows a few words that he, uh, you know, he knows the name of his mother, Sycorax. That's a word, right? When I, the verbalization Sycorax has a semantic meaning. Uh, he also refers a few times uh, to his mother's god, Setebos, um, which uh, is, taken, was, is the name of a Patagonian god. Uh, he knows that word at all. So uh, it's clear that uh, he knows that word. He didn't learn those words from Prospero and Miranda, right? Uh, so he had at least some small measure, and presumably a much, if he knows those two things, presumably, uh, you know, when they got to the island, uh, it might have sounded like gabble to them. Uh, but in all likelihood, he was speaking uh, his mother's language. He knows all this other stuff, right? Um, uh, notably, then, the bias inherent in Miranda's presumption is congruent with a tendency in New World reports to emphasize the inability of indigenous people to speak any recognizable European language. So uh, reports back from the New World, colonists, this is uh, Spanish colonists mostly, um, are saying similar things uh, about indigenous people. Um, uh, uh, that, uh, oh, we got there, well, you know, usually emphasized alongside all their other kind of exotic qualities. Wow, it's so weird. They, they don't know how to speak any language. They just make this weird noise, right? They just assume because uh, it's not a recognizable language that it's just, uh, you know, weird sounds. Uh, on a similar note, colonial reports from Ireland, Ireland again, very, very important in how Engl uh, England's thinking about uh, Virginia. Colonial reports from Ireland regularly described Gaelic uh, and other Irish languages as gabble. Uh, and often with uh, Ireland, that word uh, gabble uh, is directly related uh, to discourse uh, coming out of I uh, Ireland in particular. Uh, so it's notable that uh, Miranda should choose that specific word, uh, gabble. Uh, and the idea, again, is uh, you know, because they're unable to speak, uh, it offers support for the notion that the Irish na natives are just too bestial. They're just animals, right, uh, to be capable of actual human speech. They just make this weird noise. So following a pattern established by foregoing colonists, Prospero and Miranda make language instruction the first step in a process of conversion, uh, but also regard linguistic difference as indicative of an innate inferiority. So often, uh, both in Ireland and the New World, uh, task one is, to, is language instruction, right? Before you can enslave somebody, uh, you have to, you know, uh, have, they've got, they've got to be able to understand what you're saying, right? So uh, language training is often uh, the first step. With this pattern in view, uh, note that Miranda's argument for Caliban's irredeemability hinges not on an inability to learn. She admits, you know, although you're able to learn, uh, you did learn, uh, you know, how to speak with us, uh, uh, but his irredeemability hinges on an inability of learning to impress the print of goodness, that's her words again, the print, on his nature, right? So the language instruction can work, but it, it doesn't bring goodness along with it. 
Uh, and this is a very, very familiar pattern in conversional dynamics, especially in a colonial context. You know, the, the idea about conversion, uh, to get to the Bible, you know, St. Paul's idea of conversion, it's really an idea about equality. Anybody can come into the family, you can become my brother, uh, and we're the same. Uh, in a colonial context, though, when race becomes part of the picture, uh, they always sort of leave a gap, right? So we want to bring you into the family and make you one of the brothers, but only up to a point, right? You're not really part, you're still, you know, you're converted, but you're not, uh, you can never actually be fully converted, just enough so that I can be your master and, uh, you know, but uh, doesn't want to go any further than that. Ultimately, Although Miranda wants to take credit for selflessly endeavoring to mold her pupil into a better, more civilized being, her fundamental contention is that conversion is powerless to reverse aspects of personhood inscribed by blood relations. Especially, I'll note again, she says, your vile race, right? It's in your blood that you just can never, uh, you never fully, fully transform. Rather than expressing any sign of shame or remorse in response to Miranda's uh, excoriation, however, Caliban, you know, no matter how hard they come at him, he's just always cool as a cucumber. Caliban reacts by exposing his master's charity as a self-serving attempt to bring him to heel. Unembarrassed by his alleged incompatibility with goodness, but Caliban just brushes them off. I don't care about goodness, your definition of goodness. He defiantly declares that the worthless gift of language has only proved useful insofar as it's enabled him to curse. He said, well, the good thing about learning, you know, you teaching me language is like, I know how to swear at you now, right? Um, uh, and I'm able, he says, I'm able to curse the false benefactors who gave me language in the first place. That's the only good thing that it's for. Um, despite these brave words, however, Caliban exhibits a marked tendency towards self-debasing servility in the following act. Uh, so we get a totally different view of Caliban in Act 2 when he unexpectedly becomes the central figure in a grotesque inversion of conversional enlightenment. Shortly after receiving his first taste of alcohol from the drunken butler Stefano, he experiences an explosive moment of inspiration, or what we might call uh, parodic inspiration, and he immediately begins to make wild declarations about the person he will become from that point forward. Uh, so the scene uh, where Stefano and Trinculo, they give Caliban some alcohol. Uh, Stefano and Trinculo are the two clown characters. One's, uh, you know, they're both uh, uh, kind of just complete fools. Um, um, and it mirrors a lot of accounts of uh, colonial encounters where colonists would uh, give indigenous people alcohol uh, as a way, you know, get them inebriated and as a way of sort of manipulating them and uh, gaining power over them. Uh, so this is the scene uh, uh, here. Uh, as, and as soon as uh, Trinculo and Stefano see Caliban, they immediately, both of them, begin to see uh, dollar signs and uh, think about ways that they can cash in. Uh, right, so uh, exploitation is very, very clearly their motive. They're much more straightforward about it than Prospero. Okay, so I'm going to uh, try and perform all three roles to the best of my ability. Um, Caliban says, so Caliban's enamored with these guys. He's like, okay, I want to, you know, forget Prospero. I want you guys to be my new masters. So here he goes. I'll show thee every fertile inch of the island, and I will kiss thy foot. I prithee, be my god. By this light, a most perfidious and drunken monster, when his god's asleep, he'll rob his bottle. I'll kiss thy foot. I'll swear myself thy subject. <clears throat> Come on, then. Down. Swear. So he's getting him to you know, get on, down on his knees. I shall laugh myself to death at this puppy-headed monster, a most scurvy monster. I could find it in my heart to beat him. Come, kiss. But that poor monster's in drink, an abominable monster. I'll show thee the best springs. I'll pluck thee berries. I'll fish for thee and get thee wood enough. 
a plague upon the tyrant that I serve. I'll bear him no more sticks, but follow thee, thou wondrous man. So, uh, as I said, the scene of initial encounter between Stefano Trinculo and Caliban presents a ludicrous caricature of colonial processes as nakedly avaricious and profiteering. Right? They've got dollar signs in their eyes. From the moment when he discovers Caliban sleeping under a cloak, Trinculo immediately begins to fantasize about the fortune one might earn by exhibiting the monster Caliban in countries such as England, uh, where spectators pay top price, he says, uh, to see a dead Indian. So uh, some scholars uh, uh, have, especially the Vons, have done a lot of great work trying to figure out, did this actually happen, that in England they actually exhibited uh, the dead bodies of indigenous people for a price. And we can't find exactly that scenario happening, but it was very, very common uh, in inns uh, and alehouses and places like that where, like, a, you know, if they found a really strange looking fish or something, you could pay a little bit money, or, or a two-headed calf or things like that. Uh, and certainly uh, a number of indigenous people were brought back to England. The most famous, of course, is uh, Pocahontas, uh, and they were exhibited, just we don't have any records of a dead body being exhibited, but it's certainly the sort of thing that very well might have happened in England. Uh, and uh, by the way, those people were brought back uh, often by the Virginia Company, as, uh, you know, and they would memorize a Bible verse or something in English uh, as a way of sort of showing, oh, look, we've converted uh, this heathen. And it's a sad story, too, because I think without exception, every single one of those people who was brought back to England died shortly thereafter. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it, it was this, what he's talking about here uh, really has a ring of truth to it. Uh, on a similar note, when Stefano hears Caliban mumbling in his sleep when he first arrives on the beach uh, and, and finds him, he immediately hatches a plan to intoxicate him, tame him, and sell him to the highest bidder. Uh, so again, the same ideas. We'll um, use alcohol as a way of sort of manipulating and gaining control over people. In contrast to Prospero and Miranda, then, the comic characters do not make so much as the slightest effort to sugarcoat the self-interest guiding their conversional designs. And in contrast to the sharp-witted, defiant Caliban of Act 1, Scene 2, the Caliban in Scene 2, or Act 2, Scene 2, uh, is suddenly very, very pathetic uh, and absurd. By holding these would-be masters and their would-be subject up to the glare of satiric derision, the play raises some penetrating questions about the unvarnished truth of colonial conversion in actual practice, right? So uh, in Act 1, Scene 2, we kind of get Prospero's story and the very sort of noble uh, justification for colonization and conversion. Uh, in Act 2, Scene 2, we get the contrast, and it's kind of like you're saying, okay, this is what they say it's like in Act 1, and Act 2, it's more like this is really what they're really like, right? This, this is actually what happens. It's all about exploitation and profit. Thus, in contrast to the sanctimonious visions of colonial rule promoted by Prospero and the Virginia propagandists, Shakespeare offers a carnivalesque warts and all vision that replaces sanctimony with an earthy alertness to the vagaries of human nature. Uh, in, oh, sorry, I keep on forgetting to advance my slide. Uh, there we go. Uh, in the final act, however, Caliban makes yet another turn that suggests he may in fact be capable of genuine conversion after all. So there's kind of a, a, another version uh, of Caliban at the end of the play. So as the play draws to a close and Prospero you know, gets rid of his old island outfit and uh, puts on his uh, uh, attire as a duke again, and he's got all his enemies, old enemies gathered in front of him, and it's, you know, it's the moment of the big reveal. Uh, he, uh, Caliban compares the ridiculousness of Trinculo and Stefano against the noble refinement of Prospero. Caliban's really impressed by how good uh, Prospero looks now that he's put on his old Duke clothing again. He's kind of looking over at Stefano and Trinculo thinking, man, how, how did I ever fall for those idiots, right? Look how good Prospero looks. And he expresses a sober resolve to amend his behavior in the future. And here's what he says. 
I'll be wise hereafter and seek for grace. What a thrice double ass was I to take this drunkard for a god and worship this dull fool. So there he is, right? I'm going to, looks a little bit maybe like a conversion, hard to tell. Uh, I'm going to be wise hereafter. I'll seek for grace. I'm not going to go for those guys. I'll go for these. So it's a moment of some, something's going on there, right? And then, uh, so uh, the question to ask then, are, are these lines indicative of a movement toward conversion? How exactly does Pro Caliban's story end? What are we supposed to make of, uh, it's a very quick moment. It goes by very, very quickly. It's often cut uh, in productions. In an analysis that puts strong emphasis on the theological valences in, uh, inherent in the term grace, uh, grace is a, a really important uh, a theological term in this period. It still continues to be uh, a very, very uh, important, you know, especially uh, uh, for the Protestants and, and Calvinism. It's all about the grace of God, right? Um, so uh, another sort of notable choice of words that Caliban uses here. So uh, really sort of focusing on uh, uh, the valencies of that word grace, the scholar G. van Gurung has argued that the example of Prospero's compassion has awakened Caliban's conscience. Uh, and Gurung says that uh, what we see here is the initiation of a total experience of religious conversion. So that's uh, one way to look at the scene anyway. Uh, for many other critics, however, uh, the moment comes across as conspicuously understated. As I said, it goes by very, very fast. It's not the sort of big, explosive, uh, monumental kind of conversional turn that you usually see in you know, older forms of conversional drama. Um, it's you know, a little bit flat, or a lot flat, subdued. Unconvinced of Caliban's sincerity, but nevertheless attuned to the scene's conversional uh, shadings, Deborah Willis concludes that Caliban does not undergo what she calls a full conversion. So uh, arguing against Gurung here. Uh, and she notes that Caliban seems more motivated by his dislike of appearing ridiculous than by remorse. So uh, for Willis, it's not that we're not seeing a big change of uh, behavior, a dramatic turn here, so much as Caliban's embarrassed, right? He's kind of, you know, he's been drunk and he's sobered up a little bit and he's like, what was I doing, right? And he's trying to save face. It's more about embarrassment. Um, this assessment is echoed by Stephen Greenblatt, uh, who describes Caliban's turn in this scene as a mumbled reformation, that it's, um, you know, it's not, uh, big and sincere, that it's sort of, you know, again, subdued. So then uh, there's uh, a critical debate here, and, and many other critics have, have weighed in on this question, by the way. So the $1 million question here then is, has Caliban really changed? Uh, is he even capable of change? Remember, Miranda says, uh, you know, it's in the blood. He can't possibly change uh, because of his vile race. Uh, is he sincere in his resolution to be wise hereafter? You know, how, what, what do we make of this? Ultimately, it seems as though the most one can say with any degree of confidence, uh, again, is that the scene is purposefully open-ended, is, as is par for the course with Shakespeare very often. In lieu of a definitive, fully satisfying exposition of conversional experience, Shakespeare ends by pointing to the possibility that Caliban might convert. I think that's as close as what we get here. So maybe it's a might, he might, but it doesn't go all the way. He doesn't double down on it. But he obliges his spectators to draw conclusions for themselves. Uh, and on a similar note, as I've already mentioned, spectators are also obliged to answer some needling questions about Prospero. Does the movement toward reconciliation and forgiveness truly erase Prospero's faults or simply brush them under the carpet? Do Caliban's stinging accusations disappear from memory by the end of the play? Like if we've forgotten all that stuff in Act 1, Scene 2, where he's in uh, this island's mind speech? Or uh, do those ac accusations still kind of echo dissonantly in the background when he says, I'll be wise hereafter? Right? Um, uh, and he makes these pledges to reform. 
Uh, so to a large extent, one's answers to these questions will determine one's impression of the play's position on colonialism and one's impression of the play as a whole. Notably, however, this quality of interpretive openness, leaving questions open and, and soliciting the audience's uh, uh, engagement, uh, is a feature uh, rather than a flaw. So when I say the play is open-ended, I don't mean to say that as a criticism or that to suggest that it's a, somehow an imperfection. Uh, by repre uh, representing, or sorry, by presenting a very robust but relatively ambivalent interrogation of colonial hyperbole, Shakespeare invites his audience to engage an exceptionally rich and challenging exercise in conversional thought. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. That is it. Thank you. I think probably the prevailing question, this is a, typically a Bible class, and we're at the beginning of an arc of looking at the Bible. We're basically looking inside the Bible and learning uh, Bible stories and that sort of thing. Uh, Stephen's work is more, in our view right now, meta. Mm -hmm. But I will get to that, and I will promise you that in our future I will tie what he has said into our class. But chiefly this is that Christianity has uh, historically moved from place to place, successfully con converting people, and then in some cases not so successfully, not so successfully in Japan. But these people who went to the States, of course with their Christianity, the Bible was with them. Right, and we're very close to the publication of the King James Bible that we're considering mm -hmm. in 1611. And that Bible probably had a stronger reception in the United States, what's now the United States, uh, than in England. Because uh, they, they hung on to uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, Geneva Bible for uh, a period. But anyhow, those th same people later became Methodists when John Wesley made it from Oxford, and then he went over to Georgia and the States and started a new congregation. And then those Methodists made it over by the end of the 19th century to this little island nation, <coughs> just like the Tempest and Shakespeare's Tempest, uh, with limited success in uh, being able to mm -hmm. subjugate the people uh, who were speaking just fine at that point. But I will, I will bring all of those points in. Right now in our arc, what we're looking at, we're in the Old Testament, and this is something we can maybe talk about later, is not the, um, uh, well, it's, the, it's how quickly people can wander away from the established order. And that's the Old Testament story of trying to bring people out of slavery. It's almost a sort of reverse thing, isn't it? going out of slavery, liberating yourself, and the problems over and over, whether we take this as a history or a fiction or whatnot, over and over, people wandering away. The, the ease at which they would be converted to something else, like a golden calf and so forth. So that's where we're going. Now, if any of you have any questions, please, uh, this is a good time to ask. And uh, again, Stephen, thank you again so much. So we talked a lot about conversions in, obviously, around Shakespeare's time. But in the world right now, there's still missionaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still people trying to convert people to their point of view, sometimes in a religious setting, sometimes politically. What kind of parallels do you draw from your Shakespeare scholarship with what's going on in the world today, being religious? Or right, or right. Um, <clears throat> Maybe one of the first things uh, I should say, uh, you know, about you know, my analysis here is focused on the Virginia Company and you know, a very kind of specious and uh, uh, hypocritical justifications for colonialism uh, and conversion. Uh, a, a part of the story that I should also note uh, is that there are a lot of people who went over and did that sort of work. Uh, with very sort of sincere and uh, noble intentions also at heart. Um, I don't think, you know, the people that we're talking about here, uh, you know, the propagandists, they're being paid money and they get stock options and it's uh, clearly a very sort of uh, manipulative, uh, propagandistic uh, strategy. Uh, that's certainly not the case in early modernity. 
um, <clears throat> with uh, all missionaries, I don't think. Um, you know, people uh, in early modernity and uh, uh, today as well, uh, you know, die for their cause and uh, take it very, very seriously. And I think there is, you know, whether we uh, agree with uh, their mission or not, uh, there is a, a degree of nobility there. And I don't mean to uh, suggest that the Virginia colon colonists are representative of uh, all missionaries across the board. Uh, so just to sort of uh, get that uh, uh, piece in there. Um, uh, but your question was about modern day uh, uh, parallels. Um, so this idea of conversion then, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very old idea, even actually predates uh, Christianity. Um, but it's something that really gains a lot of steam as soon as you get uh, a monotheistic paradigm, right? So conversion's less of a thing in ancient Greece because you can go from, there's many, many gods and you can worship, uh, but uh, when you have to dedicate yourself and make an exclusive com commitment to just one, uh, that's when conversion really begins to take. And then in uh, early modernity, I'm sorry, I'm giving you the long uh, version here. Uh, in early uh, modernity, uh, uh, it becomes a much bigger and more robust and comprehensive conceptual tool becomes, because it becomes uh, politicized and also militarized and uh, uh, encoded into legal theory and law, right? So things such as the Spanish Inquisition uh, are a really big uh, political development uh, for this idea of conversion. Um, uh, and, and so there's a, I'm trying to get around to the modern day uh, legacy. Uh, so one of the things that I've written about uh, a little bit uh, is the so-called uh, conversion therapy, which is a really uh, big, uh, you know, and they use, in very, very interestingly, use that word conversion. So there's still kind of this uh, religious valence to it, and st still, in, in, in the case there, uh, a religious framework as well. Conversion therapy, for those of you who may not know, uh, is uh, this idea that you can take somebody uh, who is uh, 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 gay or transgendered, uh, and uh, they usually send them off to these camps or these retreats, um, and they try to pray away the gay, so to speak. Uh, and it, the tactics are, uh, in many cases, very, very abusive. Uh, and at the least, very sort of dismissive of people's sense of personhood. You know, that they're told that they're, they're evil or that there's something wrong with them. Uh, and these uh, so-called conversional uh, therapies uh, can turn them into a new person, right? So the essential uh, structures of uh, religious conversion are still there, right? It's, it's kind of like a prodigal son story or, you know, uh, making yourself in. So that's uh, one, I think, key example. Uh, another one that I point to often uh, more on the political end of conversional uh, ideology are things uh, uh, right now, another very, very big uh, heavy issue uh, are China's uh, conversion camps or re-education camps uh, in the Xinjiang provinces, yeah, for uh, Muslims or uh, indigenous Muslim populations. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Chinese don't want uh, Muslim culture to th uh, thrive. It's not good for uh, their vision of uh, what uh, the future of China should look like. Uh, you know, and so they're shipped, these people are, uh, the Uyghurs are shipped off to these camps. Uh, where again, it's the same thing. They're uh, like uh, Miranda's program of re-education, that they're, uh, uh, they have to sing songs, they have to make uh, demonstration, emotional demonstrations and give these uh, speeches of how they've changed. Uh, and it's the same uh, essential blueprint of uh, more heavy-handed uh, conversional tactics that uh, Shakespeare's the thinking about in The Tempest and that were practiced uh, in not only the Virginia colonies, but in, in a lot of uh, colonial ventures. Um, uh, so th those, those are two, but there's, you know, there's many other examples, but I think those are two of the most really sort of pressing and uh, from just from a critical uh, point of view, kind of conceptually interesting uh, manifestations of uh, conversional thinking in our own age. Uh, and you know, we owe a lot, you know, that, that evolution 
uh, owes a tremendous debt, is derives from that explosion of thinking in early modernity uh, that I was speaking about in, in the introduction. Thank you. Okay, we're about out of time. No. Um, we have a few more seconds left in the period. So thank you guys for coming. I promised you that I would give you a, an, uh, a test <coughs> on Stephen's lecture, and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure there were people here, but uh, I, I see who's here. And that's too bad. I like the idea of a test. Yeah, testing, I want to know. Yeah. On, yeah that's, uh, th no, that's a little bit too uh, colonial for me. Right. Uh, and, <laughs> that is. Uh, it's, you're here for your own edification. And I'll look forward to seeing you in our next class. And we'll be back to the Bible. Oh, okay, thank you that is the bell. Thank you, everybody.